allow your attention to settle on the breath and hold in mind the perception that the whole body is breathing, all the nerves, all the blood vessels, all the cells. It creates a nice spacious sense here in the present. And see how long you can maintain that perception. And what happens to your sense of the body, your sense of yourself sitting here, as you keep that perception in mind? Then read the various sensations you have in the body in terms of that perception. It helps give you a grounding. We want the mind to settle here in the present moment, but you have to have it settled with a sense of ease and well-being. You don't want to feel like it's imprisoned here in the present, but you do want it to stay so you can find some place in the body where the breathing feels really comfortable. Focus your main attention on that, and then think of that sense of comfort spreading around. So as you breathe in, the whole body feels comfortable. There may be pains here and there. Or patterns of tension here and there, but try to breathe around them. We're trying to put the mind in a position where it can observe itself. Because the whole point of the teaching is that the suffering that really weighs us down is the suffering that's created by the mind itself. There may be things happening outside that we don't like, and some of them can be really bad. The question of whether that exterior influence is going to have an influence on the mind has a lot to do with how the mind relates to things outside and how it relates to itself. We're trying to change the balance of power, change the mind's habits. As the Buddha said, the kind of suffering we're dealing with is the suffering that comes from craving and clinging. Craving and clinging give rise to what he calls becoming. Becoming is when you take on an identity around a particular desire. You want things to be a certain way. Then you look at yourself and you ask, okay, what do I have within me that can actually bring that desire about? How about the world around me? What is there in the world that can help bring that desire about? And also, what's going to get in the way? And what do I have inside that gets in the way? When you start asking those questions, you get into what the Buddha calls becoming. It's a sense of identity in a particular world of experience, all based around a particular desire. You notice you've, the desires define the way you experience not only yourself but also the world. If you have a desire for chocolate, you immediately know where in the world the chocolate is and what's getting in the way of your getting it. If you have a desire for a new car, a new partner, those are the parts of the world that become relevant, either the things that help, help you get what you want or the things that get in the way. And everything else becomes irrelevant. When you look at the process, you begin to realize that you go through many different becomings in the course of a day. When you're hungry for food, okay, it takes on a certain kind of becoming. When you're hungry for companionship, that's another kind of becoming. It all depends on how you read your hungers and then how you build up a sense of yourself and the world around around you in terms of your desire. And we tend to be very much inside our becomings, which is why we can't see them clearly. What we're trying to do as we practice is to create a little space around those becomings so you can step back a bit and see, oh, this is how the process happens. And you realize that you have a choice to identify or not identify with that particular becoming. And you're much less a slave to them. Every aspect of the practice, starting from generosity on up, is a way of stepping back from your ordinary total involvement in a particular sense of who you are. Think back to when you were a child and you had things that you wanted, toys that you wanted, food that you wanted. And there came the time when you realized that you could give those things away. 
you step back from your normal hungers, and you may not have commented on it in this way to yourself, but there was a sense of space around your old identity, and you step back from it. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha encourages generosity, because it helps us get out of our fixation on certain things. You step back and you realize you have more than enough of something to share. That changes your sense of who you are. It creates a little space. You realize you have the choice. You can keep something or you can give it away. That's one of the advantages of having this sense of space around your becoming, since you realize you have choices, that there was a choice someplace in that process that made you take on the identity, but you can also unchoose it, change your mind. It's the same with the precepts. The precepts against killing, stealing, illicit sex, intoxicants, lying. If you find yourself involved in any of those activities and you realize, wait a minute, there's a precept against this, you can step back. Do I really want to carry through with this? You step back and you can start observing yourself. I mean, what were the desires that got you involved in that in the first place? Do you really want to follow through with them? Especially when you think about the long-term consequences of following through. Even more so as you get into meditation. You're sitting here focusing on the breath, and other thoughts are going to come up. And it's all too easy to drop the breath and go into whatever becoming bubbles up into the mind. You have a desire to think about yesterday, and all of a sudden you're there yesterday. Think about tomorrow. Think about tomorrow's meal. Think about tomorrow's activities. You're there even though you're sitting here in the body, but you're in another world. And then suddenly you realize, oh, wandered off. It's like being in a dream and suddenly waking up. You're supposed to be here meditating, so you come back to the breath. And in the beginning stages, this is a lot of what the meditation is about. Being with the breath for a while and then forgetting, and then going off into some other world. But when you realize, okay, you can be with the breath and these thoughts can come up and you don't have to go with them. That's when concentration gets stronger. You realize that you have this alternative place to stay. And by making it really comfortable and making it really spacious, you make it easier to stay here without falling asleep. That sense of space is important. If you're focused on one little tiny point and the breath gets more and more refined and you lose that point, you're off. It's what they call delusion concentration, where you're still but you're not really clear about what you're focused on or where you are. When you come out, there's a question, was I asleep? Well, not really. Was I awake? Well, it wasn't really awake. So to prevent that, as soon as there's a sense of well-being in the body, spread your awareness to fill the whole body. And when you're in this enlarged frame of reference, then when a thought bubbles up, you see it as a bubble, and you realize you don't have to get into the bubble, because the bubble will float away for a while and then break. Do you really want to go there? You've been in lots of bubbles in the past. How about staying right here? What happens as you stay right here? There's a larger sense of awareness, a larger sense of choice. You, you realize you have choices that you didn't see before. And even more so as you start developing discernment around all this, you begin to see, oh, these are the steps by which the mind creates its sense of self and creates its sense of the world. And this is the suffering or the stress that results. Do I want to go there? When you realize you have the alternative, you don't have to go there. Then there's an even greater sense of spaciousness and freedom in the mind. We look particularly into things arising in the mind, but it's not just to see enough to see, okay, they come and they go, and they come and they go. There's more to insight than just arising and passing away. There's what the Buddha calls origination, which means that when things arise, there's a cause. There's something you're doing, particularly when stress gets stronger in the mind. You want to be able to see, well, what did I do just then? And to see that, you have to be able to step back. You need that larger sense of space around what you're doing.
and you see the choices that were involved in these steps in the process. A lot of times it's done on automatic pilot. It's so habitual that it becomes part of the background. It's a pattern on the wallpaper. So you want to look into that pattern. Don't just leave it in the background. Look at it. How does the mind take on these identities? How does it drop one and pick up another? The fact that you're with the breath, with the body, gives some space around the process so you can step back and watch it. And if you can't step back, you're going to be in it, and when you're in it, you can't really observe it. Of course, this sense of space itself is a kind of becoming. And it's one of the last ones you let go of. In the meantime, learn how to make use of it, because you can free yourself from a lot of your old habits that are weighing the mind down with stress, weighing it down with a sense of being burdened by things. To try to use the, the Buddhist teachings in generosity, virtue, concentration, discernment, to create some space around the processes of the mind. It gives you room to back up and watch. When you've got that room, you're that much closer to being freed from all these old habits. You see there are other ways in which you can react to the world, other ways in which the mind can relate to itself. That place a less of a burden on you and less of a burden on the people around you. <laughs>